So welcome to this special topic webinar hosted by the Conservation Fund's Conservation Leadership Network. My name is Katie Allen. I'm the director of our Conservation Leadership Network. And we hope that this will be a beneficial discussion around sharing ideas, around seeking solutions. And um, generally, what can we do during this time? Uh, this pandemic is definitely changing lives. It's changing businesses. It's changing our daily routines. So we want to um, think about what we can do today to talk about um, what we can do in the future. But through this discussion, we want to remain hopeful and we want to remain positive because we know if anything, gateway communities and rural communities are resilient. And whether it's overcoming a transitional economy, a downturn in the or a recession in and or, you know, catastrophic weather events, there are some times when we've proven to be strong to be resilient, to be even stronger together. So this is just an opportunity to discuss that today and share ideas and solutions for the future together. Just making sure that everybody can join. <laughs> so just a couple ground rules as we get started. Um, all mics are muted currently. So we're just going to um, keep everyone muted as folks join. Um, we do ask that everybody use the chat box exclusively so if you know where that chat box is you can navigate to the bottom there of your screen and include um, questions add to the discussion and share resources there in that chat box um, as when we get to the discussion point of the webinar we will call on individuals to help um, answer any questions that we have um, and then to unmute you can use that unmute button Again, you'll stay unmuted until we call on you and you can unmute yourself there. So just a quick introduction. Uh, the Conservation Fund, for those that don't know, we are a uh, national nonprofit organization. Uh, we uh, work across all 50 states and um, have a, conserved over 8 million acres since 1985. Uh, we make conservation work for each other and work for America by creating solutions that, uh, that make environmental and economic sense. At the Conservation Fund, our Conservation Leadership Network is a convener of diverse constituencies to build collaborative solutions and on the ground success. One of our priority focus areas are for gateway communities and building the capacity around a suite of services through these technical assistance topics. So you'll see those topics below and of course we're always adding to them like maybe special topics like a pandemic and really who knew that that would be something we'd be talking about to get today. We work along a, on a spectrum of readiness with communities to meet you where you are and um, make sure that we're working with you to achieve your own conservation and economic goals. So we do have a few upcoming events to keep on your radar. Um, we hope that everybody can join us um, and we'll be sharing that information. The best way to keep up to date on what we're doing is to subscribe to our mailing list. And of course you can email us whenever you have a uh, there with our contact information. Um, today's uh, webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto a website. You will all receive an email about that information um, as well as resources that we can share um, and um, with the recording of this video. And finally, So just what brings us here today, we have um, really that focus on gateway communities and rural communities have a unique position on America's landscape as these economic drivers for asset based economic development. And where we find that some of these unique challenges and opportunities is really for gateway communities to serve as the recreation portals to our nation's public lands. They're the locations for food, lodging, transportation, a whole host of recreational services and businesses that support a vibrant downtown and a small business community. They ultimately are magnets for business and working families and retirees, but here we are facing realities that we didn't see coming and where there was a lot of opportunity to 
and provide opportunities to recreate. We're now looking at overrun assets and where people are looking for things to do are heading out to the trails. And that leads to some hard decisions on whether the closed trails and other public spaces. Also, additionally, locations for food, lodging, transportation, and recreation services, non-essential businesses are being closed. Restaurants and services are looking for creative ways to stay open and prevent layoffs and maintain business operations. Magnets for businesses, working families, and retirees, those, are, those were always a driver for uh, gateway communities. But today we're seeing sort of that loss of downtown vibrancy in the arts in our, in our gateway communities. We've, we're finding second homeowners from out of the cities are returning to their second homes and putting pressure on gateway community services. Additionally, these uh, populations are vulnerable, they're rural, they're potentially lacking healthcare access. That's positive, creating a lot of potential pro problems now as we face this crisis. So today we wanna answer some of these questions and think about solutions, about what's available, what's out there, what are opportunities. So today we wanna to talk through what should we be doing now? How can we address the economic shutdowns? How can we care for community, businesses, and employees? And what are the lessons learned already? And there's a lot to share here, so we hope that we are able to create some discussion. Yeah. Yeah. To kick things off, we're gonna turn it over to several presenters today. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kendra Breckley, to do some introductions and set the stage, um, and we'll take it from there, so I think. <laughs> we might have lost her. <laughs> well, with that, I'll just send it on to Kennedy if you want to um, start us off and share your screen. Unmute. There we go. I'm unmuted. Yep, you're unmuted. <laughs> Great. Um, I was just typing you a message saying, shall I just introduce myself? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay. It's better to not do all these. Right. So uh, I'm Kennedy yes. Smith. I love sound. So, uh, Kendra's back. I'm on now. Do you want to say anything, Kendra, or should I? We'll just go ahead. I've muted. Okay. Um, my name is Kennedy Smith. Um, I've been involved in downtown revitalization and downtown economic development for more than 30 years. I was at the National Main Street Center for okay. uh, 19 years, have had a consulting firm for 15 years focusing on downtown economic development issues. And I now am working with the Institute for Local okay. Self-Reliance. Um, and I'm going to talk a little mean? bit about things that businesses uh, can do and organizations that support businesses can do in this uh, very strange uh, period that we find ourselves in. Um, and the first thing is, of course, is just to help prevent the virus from spreading. And businesses are being, uh, for the most part, pretty responsible about that, especially smaller businesses. Uh, businesses have been a little bit alarmed at seeing people crowding into big box stores, but the small businesses seem to uh, have adapted pretty quickly to doing things like uh, pickup and delivery. Uh, I came across I this space um, hardware store, which has a little hand washing station outside, and then very clear directions about what's the entrance and the exit and a green light for you to go in and uh, really monitoring and taking seriously um, the need to contain the virus. Uh, businesses are shifting very quickly to contact contactless uh, transactions no watch. as a way to um, uh, to help control it. It's important also for businesses to maintain contact uh, with, with with their, their um, uh, customers uh, throughout this. Uh, and those who have developed email lists over the years are, are in a much obviously better position to do that now than uh, those who haven't taken care of that. Uh, developing new ways to serve customers. One of the things that's kind of amazed me over the past few weeks is that for years and years, I've been talking about the importance of developing uh, new distribution channels for businesses, um, deliveries and things like that. And I've been talking about their telephone orders and curbside pickup for a long time. All of a sudden in two weeks, every small business has learned how to do this and has made that adaptation. Um, and that kind of encourages me thinking that small businesses may be learning some skills um, that are gonna serve, serve us well um, into the future. Um, small business to, uh, um, and pickup and delivery, not only for food related businesses, but uh, bookstores and um, toy stores and all kinds of businesses are um, jumping on the bad wagon quickly and communities uh, have responded within just days to make parking spaces available for uh, for that. Um, offering uh, new ways to reach customers through the mail. This is a, a women's clothing boutique um, in California that 
uh, offered free shipping and tweeted that out to their customers uh, for anything that they would buy online. And within an hour of having done so, she got 20 orders. Um, lots of uh, uh, service providers and businesses are gravitating towards, uh, towards uh, doing business online, uh, yoga studios and fitness classes. Um, this is a guy who uh, gives you cooking lessons, uh, restaurateur uh, by uh, FaceTime. This is a women's clothing boutique that uh, is having a, a Facebook Live sales um, every day. And businesses are making deliveries and putting in vending machines and finding lots of other creative ways. People are out and about safely, but they're still interested in, you know, seeing that there is life uh, in our communities. And so I'm beginning to see more and more small businesses making their storefronts fun and engaging and putting out things for people to, uh, to take away. Businesses, some businesses are pivoting quickly too. This is a, um, a restaurant called Prairie, which is basically converted itself into a temporary general store uh, to help people get uh, provisions that they need. Um, I've never seen before a bowl of toilet paper for sale next to a table full of wine bottles, but uh, there you go. Uh, selling things that they basically could get from their uh, own wholesaler uh, and distributor. Uh, a restaurant in my own neighborhood, Cheese Teak, is doing the same thing. They've asked their supplier what, what they have on hand and they've made available cleaning materials um, and uh, produce um, in what is basically a cheese-centric uh, sit-down restaurant with a deli bar. Uh, it's important to reward customers for uh, sticking, sticking with you. Um, and businesses and business districts are doing stuff like Kalamazoo, Michigan did. If you buy a $25 gift, gift card for uh, a collection of downtown businesses, they basically give you a card worth 35 bucks. If you find yourself in financial trouble, negotiate with your landlord. Uh, I've come across some small businesses in the past week or two that have renegotiated a percentage uh, lease instead of a flat fee lease um, and are basically pushing, pushing their lease term back um, with a gap here that they can then basically amortize the amount of the rent that they miss um, over a period of the next two or three years. Take care of your employees. Um, again, she's Teak is kind of jumping into the, uh, the void here in my neighborhood um, and working with a couple of neighborhood nonprofits is making family meals available for free to hospitality workers in the neighborhood. Use this time productively. Um, everyone is sort of operating on partial capacity and that's kind of a good time to, uh, to do some, some new stuff that you've wanted to do. I, um, I did pick up in delivery from a restaurant uh, in downtown DC that we love a couple of weeks ago. And um, I looked in the window and lo and behold, they're using this time to refinish their hardwood floors, um, which I thought was kind of nice. It's a good time to, uh, to plan and design awesome storefront window displays, um, to take some free classes. There are lots of classes available uh, right now for free online. Um, and a really good time to look at performance measures and performance indexes uh, of small business performance. The three that I think are really important for retail and uh, restaurant businesses are quick ratio, profit profitability ratio, and inventory turnover. Those are things that small businesses should be measuring on an ongoing basis, but in reality, when everything is so busy, they often uh, slip off the radar screen. This is a good time to take a, a look back at the past year's performance. Um, and see how you can improve things uh, once the world returns to normal. Then there are things that the organizations that support small businesses can do to help small businesses get through this. Um, one of the most important ones is simply to let the public know which businesses are opening uh, are open now and how they're operating. Um, is it are they online? Is it telephone? Are they doing curbside pickup? Do they do deliveries? Um, how exactly can you reach them? Um, this is, I think, a nice a nice website that put together uh, with nice photos uh, we each business in the area is doing. This is a more utilitarian version, uh, but it works perfectly fine. Um, encouraging the public to uh, continue to, uh, to support businesses um, through online newsletters, through email blasts, everything you can think of to make this uh, uh, front and center. Um, look for businesses and business categories that maybe don't operate out of a traditional storefront, but still need help. Um, like uh, farmers markets, which you know the farmers still need to sell things, and so I've seen some communities very quickly adapt to uh, finding ways to um, direct people directly to the farmers wherever they are, uh, instead of to the farmers market. Uh, helping businesses find uh, emergency capital uh, to get through this. Alana is going to talk about some of the SBA and 
uh, treasury programs that are uh, uh, um, rolling out right now. Um, I wanted to mention a couple other things, and one of them is crowdfunding. Uh, the UK has always been a couple of beats ahead of the US on crowdfunding, and uh, sure enough, one of their their two major crowdfunding platforms uh, a couple of weeks ago, crowdfunder.co.uk, UK started um, making uh, free crowdfunding platforms available for businesses that are affected by coronavirus. Um, that's happening here now very quickly. This is a bookstore in Ann Arbor, Michigan called Literati um, that raised $100,000, 110000 bucks in two days um, so that it could keep itself going for the next two months and keep all of its staff employed. Um, if you haven't heard about what GoFundMe is doing, they basically have formed a partnership uh, with Yelp and Intuit QuickBooks um, and Quicken to, um, to, to basically populate a GoFundMe page with a, with a, a generic uh, fundraising goal of $2,500 for every business that has been claimed by an owner on Yelp so far, it's something like 10,000 businesses. So as you, as you see, as you look at this page, the first business there obviously has set its own goal and is active in, in promoting this, but the others all have that generic uh, goal of 2,500 bucks. So it, it's very possible that businesses that are in your communities have GoFundMe pages now and don't even know about it. So uh, make sure that they know that it's there. And if they don't have one, they can create one just by following the links and they're heading for COVID-19 uh, resources. Um, they're also offering a matching grant program. Uh, they'll offer $500 in cash uh, for the first $500 that the business is able to uh, on GoFundMe. Uh, we don't know what the landscape after COVID-19 is going to be, um, but things that uh, seem logical to me at this point are, uh, one, the retail landscape is going to thin out considerably, especially among national retail chains. Um, they were already very hard hit um, by economic cycles and overbuilding and a lot of factors, uh, overextension, um, before COVID-19, this is really uh, going to hurt a lot of them. I heard, I just read a couple of days ago that uh, Macy's only has enough cash to survive about four months. So um, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, closures. Um, and closures to me among uh, national retail chains, potential opportunities for smaller businesses to uh, pick up some of the sales that they might have been doing um, and add merchandise, spin off a new business. So there'd be some um, opportunities coming coming out of this. I also think that this whole thing has uh, put a whole new focus on the importance of local shopping, people recognizing that um, when it comes down to it, it's much easier to get a product from somebody down the street than to order it online and get it from somebody in China. Um, and it really is the small businesses that the country right now uh, in this moment of crisis. Like I said earlier, um, businesses are adapting very quickly to new ways of reaching their customers. And that's a habit that I hope sticks around. Um, when things begin to return to normal, because I think it'll mean that it'll be much easier for people to uh, to shop in new ways. Um, I was talking to a commercial real estate uh, broker the other day, and he says that he believes that because people are are telecommuting now in record numbers, um, that that might mean some softness uh, in the office market in older downtowns um, and uh, shopping centers uh, coming up in the years ahead. So that's something that we're going to have to uh, to keep an eye out for. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Ilana. Thank you. Always great to follow in your footsteps, Kennedy. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you all for having me. I am going to share my screen and talk a little bit about what else we can do. So uh, my name is Ilana Pruce. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a firm called Recast City. Um, when it's not uh, a time of crisis, um, I do a lot of things related to uh, things that, that are, I think are key to a lot of your communities around um, how do we bring small scale manufacturing into downtowns and into redevelopment projects to create more and better jobs in communities. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about what's going on right now because uh, all I'm doing right now is trying to share information and share thinking about how do we save small businesses in our communities. Um, and I think Kennedy's ideas specifically for the small businesses is really essential in this time. Um, just a, by way of background, 
um, this picture on the left is an amazing dress that my mother sewed for me when I was in uh, 10th grade. Um, and the one on the right is a, a really uh, amazing opportunity. I had to give a TEDx talk about the economic power of great places. So my whole career has been about making and about um, and the, and places and how do we make strong places. And my work with Recast City, as I said, is really focused on how do we bring that together. The role of small scale manufacturing to be a, anybody who's making a, a tangible product, um, including for the outdoor recreation economy, um, and how do we bring them into our storefronts, into vacant properties to really bring uh, good, strong um, jobs and businesses into our communities. Uh, and we can always talk about that on another day. But for me, it always comes down to sitting down with the small business owners um, and with the communities that want to lead on that and really helping make a difference in both business development as well as space for these businesses. Right now, it's not a space issue, right? Our space issue is that everything's closed. But when we think about what small businesses need, I think it's important to think through it as a framework. And, and Kennedy started to allude to some of these pieces. Um, there's three main pieces of the framework, and th I, this is not my framework. I stole it from somebody else. First is, our first step is we're all working on this, right? We have to contain um, what uh, is going on and figure out how to um, be, the, the, be the rational voice in our communities and really help people stay home. Second, we need to be able to provide relief. Um, to people and so that's for people who've lost their job that's in form of the new unemployment insurance addition that was passed last week uh, in terms of uh, the the new covid bill which is the third bill that they've passed um, that also means in terms of our small businesses uh, new federal programs uh, have their acronyms here but i promise to explain them in a minute um, and then state and local programs that are popping up to help our small businesses. And then we have to very quickly, or not so quickly, think about rebuilding. How do we come out of this? Um, and from my perspective, how do we come out of this uh, building a more inclusive economy um, so that more of our communities and more of our community members um, can really have strong footing in our economy in what they're doing and what they're creating. There's three key pieces to the relief and rebuild. Um, and, and I wanna focus on these for a second. Uh, one is that we know that small business owners with strong social connections weather crises better. Um, this is from research during Katrina. Um, and so the more that we can do to find our small business owners within our community, ones that are in bricks and mortar, ones that are at home, ones that are, that are in all different contexts, the more that we find them and connect with them and connect them to each other, the more likely they're going to have the capacity to survive this or at least come back out of this and rebuild afterwards. Second of all, and this is a great part of what Kennedy was talking about, we have to help our small businesses find new sources of revenue. And that might be pivoting to do something completely different, like a restaurant becoming a, a general store. Um, there's a bunch of manufacturers that have pivoted to create emergency gear for hospital workers. Um, but it also might be a pivot to do something else that they haven't ever done before as a service business. If they're uh, someone who works in a salon and they can't do that, over the remote, because God knows no, nobody's gonna be teaching me how to cut my own hair right now. Um, what else can they do? What else do they know how to do where they can be, be uh, someone who's creating revenue right now? So helping people go through that pivot process, helping them actually come together as groups of small business owners to think through those pivots and those new sources of revenue together. And then third, I think we have a responsibility to provide relief that reaches all of our populations. Um, in this time of crisis, the all levels of government are throwing out loan and grant programs um, to try to help people. The reality is those programs are gonna be first come first serve and they don't actually fit the needs of every part of our population. Um, business owners that are from low income households, um, immigrant business owners, lots of different reasons, people aren't gonna necessarily access these programs. So we need to figure out what else they need and figure out how to get relief to them in the way that fits their needs. I'm gonna talk about the two federal programs briefly, and I'm also gonna post a link in the chat uh, after I speak um, that gives you more detail about this in case you, you need it. Um, there, the federal bill, the most recent federal bill, got passed and signed on Friday. There's a ton of information that's coming out every day about this. There's two major programs for small businesses. One is called the, one is called the Emergency Injury Disaster mm -hmm. Loan Program, and the other one is called the Paycheck Protection program. So E-I-D-L and PPP. Yeah. You'll see those acronyms all over the place. Um, yeah, that's true. 
So um, the EIDL, Emergency oh, Injury no. Disaster Loan Program, oh, is no, a program no, no, that's no, no. Um, is a program that existed before that they've adapted to serve the needs during this crisis. So they added pandemic as a reason that you can get this disaster loan and they've added a grant component to it. So you can qualify for an EIDL if you are a small business, a nonprofit, self-employed or a sole proprietor of a business. So it's much more expansive than what the loan program allowed before because it includes self-employed, sole proprietors and contractors as well, 1099 employees. Um, it allows you to defer the payment for at least six months of this loan and the rates are different for small businesses and for nonprofits with very long-term loans. You can also use the loans to pay for debt, for payroll, uh, and for other bills that you have that are outstanding. Applicants can receive a $10,000 grant right now as a first step in the loan process. And that's really just by going into the application process um, and apply, starting to apply for it. The 10,000 grant comes through even before they've reviewed um, your application for the loan itself. Um, there is some conflicting information as to whether or not the application gets reviewed in some way before they approve the $10,000 grant. Um, but you do get, you do potentially get the $10,000 grant um, with or without approval of the longer term loan. Um, and you can apply for both the emergency injury disaster loan funding as well as the paycheck protection program, but you have to use the funds for different needs. So for instance, if you get an EIDL, and a PPP, you can use the PPP for your first two months of salaries that you're trying to cover, and then you could use the EIDL for salaries and rent after that. So they just have to be used for two different purposes. The Paycheck Protection Program is the second program. This is a brand new program that they just created. Oh, and just one, one more point about the EIDL. You apply for that directly from the SBA website, um, and I, I can sh the article that I'll share a link to um, it has a link directly into that application into it. So the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP or P3, although for any of us who did public-private partnerships, we don't call them P3. Somebody I saw called this one P-cubed. So you can pick, but the Paycheck Protection Program is also open to small business, nonprofits, people who are self-employed and sole proprietors. It covers specifically salary and benefit costs. So you calculate it by um, doing an analysis of your total salary and benefit cost on an average monthly basis. And you can apply for up to two and a half times that average monthly cost of total salaries and benefits, up to $100,000 of each employee's salary in case they make more than $100,000. Um, and, but that funding can be used towards salaries, state and local taxes um, for employees, rent and utilities, although 75% of the funds must be used for salaries. It's got a much lower uh, loan rate of 0.5%, but also a shorter term for the funding. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Paycheck Protection Program is if you uh, know that you can rehire or retain those employees for at least two months, the whole loan is forgiven. If you can retain or rehire half of the employees, then it's half forgiven, you get the idea. Um, and so it's really focusing on that employee retention process in the middle of this. Um, the challenge is, is that um, we also need to understand um, how do we support businesses that are not being served by these programs. So for instance, if you're a business that you don't think that you're going to be able to rehire people in two months because things might be, still be closed and you don't have the ability to, or don't want to go into more debt, you're not going to use both either or both of these federal programs. So what else do we need to do now to support these businesses and how do we actually do it in a way to rebuild a more inclusive economy um, so that our rural cities and towns can get the support that they need, so that people from different demographics can get support that they need. Um, and this is an important thing for us to think about now. Um, there are a few actions that I think we need to be taking at the local level to really make sure that we're connecting the dots on it. One is for any community that has small business owners who live in multiple languages, we need to make sure we're offering this small business assistance in multiple languages, um, showing people how to apply for this. One of the things I skipped over when I was talking about the Paycheck Protection Program is you apply for that program directly to local small uh, business and SBA lenders in the community. Um, and so it's your local banking community. So how can we help our small businesses in, by providing technical assistance information in multiple languages 
get to our local SBA lenders and access the PPP program, PPP funding. Second, I think we have to look at our existing networks in our communities to make sure we're getting this information out. Faith organizations, neighborhood leaders, cultural groups, any kind of civic organization. I think it's important to share information about EIDL and PPP, but also state and local uh, loan and grant information. Um, there, I'm always surprised at how separate our communities are. Um, and so we need to really figure out who are our connectors across our communities, get information to them and ask them to really disseminate it out to their own networks. There's no one person who has access to every network out there. Um, and then we also need to think about how we provide grants to the small business service providers. So our, as part of the big uh, bill from last week, our small business development centers and our women business centers are all getting additional funding for technical assistance. But we know that at the local level, there's all sorts of civic organizations and nonprofits that are providing all sorts of technical assistance and direct service to business owners. So can we provide them with small grants to really help make sure that we're providing support to business owners of color, women, immigrant populations, and really not only doing the outreach, but helping them think through these pivots and these revenue sources as they can go through it. Um, and if you, one of the things that I've been doing um, when I'm not talking about uh, small scale manufacturing right now, because everybody I know in small scale manufacturing has pivoted to be creating emergency gear for hospitals, um, is I'm just working on collecting this information as I get it. I'm DC based. I seem to be on a lot of the lists to get this information. So this last week on Monday, uh, I hosted a Zoom call with uh, Senate staffers to walk through these programs. Um, so you can sign up for the newsletter at Recast City if you're interested or connect with me and connect with me on LinkedIn, which is where all of the information I see I, uh, gets posted. Or if you have specific questions about it, um, you can reach out to me by email anytime. Um, I think one of the important things to think about is, is not only the sort of emergency, um, everyone's panicking right now, how do we figure out how to get some kind of lifeline to our small businesses and to the people in our communities, but also um, thinking about that survival. What does it mean to have our businesses survive the next bunch of months? What does it mean to be able to rebuild and who can we rebuild with afterwards? One uh, community I was talking to earlier today said, you know what, maybe this is a time where we take a breath and we really think in a transformational way, what do we really want our economy to look like as we come out the other side and, and how do we start doing that now? Um, a lot of communities are going to be getting new buckets of community development block grants out of the same bill and so um, there's a huge opportunity to be able to use that CDBG money to do something different in how we help people and help small businesses in our community. So that is it from me. Um, and, and now I'm going to turn it over to Axie. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And my goal today is to really walk you through some platforms that New Mexico is using in terms of both immediate relief and then long-term recovery. Um, I am the Outdoor Recreation Director in the state of New Mexico, located within the Economic Development Department. So much of the work over the past couple of weeks has, has pertained directly to core economic development work, um, as so many of our outdoor rec businesses are struggling just like many of our other small and medium sized businesses throughout the state. So that's really what we're focusing on. And like I said, I wanna walk through a couple platforms we've developed here in the state, give some information on why we're thinking like this um, and give you a sense of what we're planning in the future. So to start, this is really our home. Economic development department has stepped in as that information hub that, that we've talked about today. We really wanna provide information at the federal level about these programs that we just reviewed, um, making sure that the connections to the SBA and SBDCs are strong. And we also wanna provide clear information about our own programs. We found that for many businesses, it helps to look local first, that many states are quickly putting together relief programs from grants to loans, 
New Mexico qualifies in that category. Um, and these are programs that are specifically tailored to New Mexican businesses. Um, and that in many cases, there are businesses that can apply for both. For example, we've set up uh, what we're calling our LIDA 0% interest loans. Uh, that is a, it's, it's a part of a program called the Local Economic Development Act that we've had for years. We've now adjusted it so people can actually take out loans. That's a longer term project. It's more of a 60 to 90 day window. So we see that as more of the recovery plan. We want to help people get some of these immediate actionable PPP loans, um, some of the federal grants right off the bat, and then know that they also can have some money coming down the pike, potentially from the state. The state's also put together um, through a variety of community foundations, grants for small businesses, as we've talked about. And again, that money at the local level is really intended to just fill in some of the gaps, keep businesses uh, with people on their payroll, or just keep them uh, with their lights on uh, week after week. So that's much of the work that's coming from EDD. Again, we see ourselves as this hub and our goal right now is to be that information center, like I imagine many other economic development departments across the state are doing right now. And we have developed this site as a way to have information in one central place. It's updated every day. Contact information for the entire department that we're, that we're here to really help communities uh, that need it most. So another idea that's come up on this webinar is this encouraging people to buy local. Uh, so we just launched this website actually today. The, the URL is buynmlocal.com. So if there's anyone from New Mexico on this call and you know businesses in New Mexico that want some extra promotion, I'd encourage you to share this link with them. Um, for everyone else, I can give you some background on how this came about. This website to, to market our local companies. So many of them have set up e-commerce sites within the last week and a half. We are marketing those e-commerce sites, PayPal, Etsy, whatever it looks like. We're just trying to get people to buy gift cards today with the idea that they could use them tomorrow and keep some of our businesses afloat in this really, really tough time. Um, this is primarily a Main Street community work initiative. So I have been working most closely with our Main Street team within economic development to get this up and running. They've been helping populate it with businesses. Um, and every business that does not have a website, we're adding to a database and we're going to start rolling out PayPal workshops, Yelp workshops, ways to help them set up digital presences within the next week or so. So A, we can list them on the site and B, they can start to get integrated into this new normal. So they're actually seeing some revenue from the website. And not necessarily just through those classic uh, traditional distribution models uh, at their brick and mortars. So this will be an ongoing effort. We're updating it a couple of times a day. Like I said, if any of you have New Mexican connections, please share this website. And, and to everyone else, it, it did come about uh, with the goal at a statewide level to promote our, our retail and our service businesses. And, and Main Street has been a key part of that. We really identified that need for, for e-commerce and, and um, useful, searchable, nimble websites is really important to our rural communities right now. We think we have some capacity at the state level to actually help those companies that don't have such a thing get that up and running. And then of course I work within the economic, um, I work within the outdoor recreation economy. That is our mission is to support a thriving outdoor recreation economy in New Mexico and bring jobs wellness and prosperity to all state residents. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been dismantling access to the outdoors for um, obvious reasons. So I've been working really closely with a, our public land managers on closures throughout the state. New Mexico was one of the first states to close its state parks based on our uh, governor's order. She has said from the beginning that she wants people to stay home and her utmost priority is, is public health and saving lives. So that's where we're at right now. And, We've seen that play out um, in a way that I think has really helped New Mexico. We have not had the overuse issues that I think some other states have seen because state parks closed early. Um, I know that then sent other people to some of our other land access points, uh, the forest, the US, the, the Forest Service sites, the National Park Service sites, the BLM sites. We try to have communication with leaders and all of those agencies from early on with the goal of having a really cohesive message around those closures. And I think just now BLM started to close their sites and we're starting to see um, 
all overuse kind of level out. I think New Mexicans are really taking the governor's message to heart. They are staying home. They are not going to these developed recreation sites. And yeah, I can't, I can't reiterate enough how important it is, I think, to have all those people on the phone at the same time and to work early and together to close those sites so one place isn't open and everywhere else is closed. And then that one place sees, sees all the visitors. Um, our message is the Outdoor Recreation Division has been that the, the pandemic is not a time to go have an adventure. It's really a time to maybe be outside in your backyard, um, walking down your street if you can do it safely, but it's not the time to go for a big hike in our, um, on our forest service trails or out there in the BLM. And, and that's, I think, hard for many of us who, who love these places so dearly. But if, if we don't stick to that message we found, then you have a cascading effect of overuse, as I mentioned, but also putting undue pressure on some of our search and rescue teams um, and putting many of these employees who are working these places, the land managers whom we rely on, putting them more at risk. So that has been our message. It's going to remain our message for the foreseeable future. Um, we're trying to keep people at home and shut down outdoor rec sites as much as possible, as much as we can safely do that. So that's been another big part of my job over the past couple of weeks. Again, working really closely with our governor's office and then working with the people who manage these places in state and then also regionally. Our regional um, foresters have been amazing. Um, people at the U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, uh, State Parks Division, Forestry, they have all been so collaborative. And so I would encourage anyone on this call who has the capacity to do so to, to organize calls like that and um, potentially even have a, a database with those closures that's communicated to the public really clearly. That's something we're working on right now that we'll likely post on this site that you see here, the Outdoor Recreation Division site, uh, as well as our tourism site, just letting people know what's open um, and kind of the status of some of their favorite, favorite areas to, to recreate. We have a couple of grant programs that are focused more on recovery. And so we haven't rolled out those final versions yet. We're at the capacity of rural libraries to be recovery centers for many of our small businesses, especially businesses in gateway communities that might not have access to, to some of these classes otherwise. So we're, we're partnering with a few nonprofits and adjusting this program that you see here, our outdoor recreation incubator grants to really be focused on recovery. So that'll come months from now, uh, but those we view rural libraries as an important hub to disseminate some of this information we're talking about now. I think people are gonna have questions for, for many, many, many weeks, many months about how to navigate the CARES Act, how to navigate the state resources, uh, whether to go for tax credits, um, how to overlay tax credits potentially with something like the PPP. Helping people navigate that pathway, I think is gonna be really key. And so we've already started to tap a few partners throughout the state, our networks throughout the state to start to, to lay that groundwork. The other department that's doing a really good job at that particular question is the tourism department in New Mexico. And I imagine tourism departments throughout the state are thinking in a similar way. They're already starting to think about recovery. They haven't rolled anything out, but this is the conversations that are happening. So right now they're really in an information gathering stage and, and it's very helpful to have businesses reach out to us early um, and tell us what they need so we can actually start to plan those, those recovery efforts. For tourism in particular, it'll be focused on hyper-local marketing. Uh, those are some of the ideas that have come about, uh, as well as hyper-local marketing that's focused specifically on outdoor rec. So again, for New Mexico, we have a couple of uh, portals that people can fill out surveys that we're, we're getting out there in front of people right now. Just surveys asking for feedback. What's the state doing well? What could we be doing better? And then what types of programs can we start to develop to specifically help you. Like that, that is an open, ever-changing conversation. We're really here to serve New Mexico and, and the best way we've found to listen to New Mexicans and business owners throughout the state is a couple of these surveys. So I'm sure that'll keep coming. The surveys right now are on the tourism department site as well as the economic development department site. And we'll just be getting that out in front of more and more people. And then finally, as far as outdoor rec goes, I'd say the two big national organizations that I found to be enormously helpful so far and are, are working around the clock to help our outdoor rec industry specifically uh, is OIA and ORR, so Outdoor Industry Association and the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. Both of those 
platforms are working diligently for our businesses. ORR, the round table is really industry focused. Many of you might interface with it now. They're really responsible for making sure that outdoor rec benefits from some of these federal programs that are coming down the pike. Uh, and then the OIA just launched a, a survey, again, asking for input from outdoor rec companies. I would encourage all of you, if you work with outdoor rec companies, to send them to that site. They're going to be putting together a series of, of reports and releasing that data to, to help offices like mine, other offices like this throughout the country, really grapple with the effect this is going to have on the outdoor industry. So again, at that information gathering stage, I think at both the federal level, those leaders of outdoor rec, and then also at the state level within tourism and economic development are really key right now. Um, so that's where I want to leave it, just with those three big platforms and kind of the main work that we're doing. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back off probably to, to Katie and open it up for some questions. Um, thanks, Axie. This is actually Kendra Brickley on the line, um, so I'm, I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you so much um, to each of our three speakers, um, Axie, Alana, and Kennedy. Um, what a great uh, a, a set of presentations um, that really sets the, the course going forward. Um, so I'm going to ask that people ask questions in the chat box. We'd like to um, field some of the questions that have come in already. Uh, and um, certainly we're um, hearing from, from people, you know, showing their local pride online in the chats, a lot of Kentucky people and uh, from even from Ontario across the country, it sounds like some friends from Pennsylvania and Georgia as well. So um, I, I'd like to actually um, focus in on uh, a question for you, Axie. There were a couple people who uh, uh, added to the the thread that you were talking about, the pushback on people going to public lands in more built up areas and the challenge that that uh, that they're facing because the field, the um, trails are really just jam packed. Uh, somebody was talking about the Santa Fe area uh, and what kind of tools might be useful to help um, provide clear messaging on which nature, which nature is accessible. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, really, like the overall state message is stay home. You can go outside, sure, in your backyard, but make it hyper local, walk down your street. And I know that that's really hard for many of us, like personally, who, who loves, I love to go to the, the Santa Fe trails, um, to the Dale Ball trails, to La Tierra, uh, the Windsor. And and you know, in, in some of those cases, we have places that probably do have a little bit more capacity and could take, take more people. We then have other places that don't have that capacity and are seeing lots and lots of people. And so it's that latter issue we're really trying to address by sticking with the clear messaging from the governor of staying home. Um, we're doing that in large part to to reduce the stress on some of those some of those really high impact areas. So I think what we can do to offer clearer messaging, I, I think this is something we need to continue doing. I 100% agree. Right now we're focusing on digital messaging. So just working with um, BOR, BLM, Forest Service, National Park Service, and all the state entities, the state parks and um, the, the state forestry division on creating a hub of information that's gonna live both on my site, the outdoor recreation division site and the tourism site that just says in really clear language, this is what's closed. Um, and this is how, you know, this is how forest closures are working right now. This is how BLM closures are working right now. Um, it's, it's not so much a marketing campaign to say, look, this is open, go here. It's really just like an informational, information hub and resource for people who wanna know about public land closures and really helping avoid some of these overuse issues while overall sticking with the messaging of stay home. Um, so that's the first step. You know, we haven't gotten beyond that. I'll be, I'll be frank. I don't know if we're gonna have the capacity within the next few months to actually set up uniform signage. There's agencies that have developed that on their own. And my guess is that's gonna be a conversation that comes out of discussions even in the next couple of weeks. What can we keep doing, especially as this progresses and we have a better sense of, of um, just timelines what we can do on the ground physically to protect these places. And like I said, right now, the priorities have been just like 
clear messaging, getting all our agencies together so we can talk about priorities, what we're seeing on the ground, and then kind of adapting day by day to that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's, that's valuable. Obviously, if people uh, on the phones, uh, on um, the, the webinar, if they have additional information or examples, we'd love to, to bring those into the fold too. After this uh, program, we will be providing a list of resources um, from a variety of different sources uh, and would welcome um, additional things that we could add on and share. Um, so there were a couple of questions uh, asking about um, the EIDL um, PPP um, program uh, and um, what resources um, there are. Uh, and the answer was posted on, on the chat, um, but uh, uh, we can go back to that. And then Tim O'Connell from Rural Development, from USDA Rural Development, also provided a, a link on, uh, from the Small Business Administration. So those are um, a few uh, additional resources. Um, okay. Um, and there was another question um, about, uh, I think this was um, for you, Alana. What is involved in licensing for a restaurant to set up um, temporary, to set up a temporary general store? I think that was That's for Kennedy. That was for Kennedy, yeah. okay, thanks, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just, I just uh, typed a response in the comments, but I think that most restaurants, because they are, that they are able to sell carry out food, for example, I think they probably are, are already good to go for selling uh, groceries and basic things like that. Um, it's probably worth sending a quick email to the town hall, but um, they should be they should be set up to do it. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. And there was a question um, for Axie as well. Um, do you include uh, New Mexico nonprofits uh, in the mix of of uh, resources? Let's see. Well, I mean, uh, they were asking. Um, not sure if that was quite enough information. Let's yeah. See. Well, I'd say yes, we have programs at the state level mm -hmm. to help nonprofits. Not all of not all of them would support nonprofits, but some of them would. So I, I think it's a little bit of a it's just a mix, like all of our programs, not, not everyone qualifies for each one. So um, in terms of the actual like you know, financial resources we have available? The short answer is yes, and we would just work with individual nonprofits to, to point them in the right direction. Um, as for the buy for today, uh, buy for tomorrow today website, um, right now we just have private sector businesses, mostly because we're looking at folks who have a PayPal set up or some other e-commerce way to buy a gift card to support them. Um, that said, literally this website launched today, you know, so I think we want to make sure we don't have mission creep and that we're actually serving businesses in the best way. Does it expand to donations to nonprofits? Maybe, but that's probably a, a conversation that maybe happens even, frankly, like this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, and that also is just really helpful feedback that we're open to get through that website that I showed or the economic development website or the outdoor recreation division website. Like, please email me or email folks on our team with just general feedback. Like, if you're in New Mexico, take the surveys. Um, because we are so nimble right now. I, I don't, I've worked in state government for seven months only. Uh, but right now it's like, it, it just, things are moving at light speed. So, you know, we're here to listen to your feedback and change these programs to best help you. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I'd leave it. It's just to say like, free, please reach out. Yes, there are programs to help nonprofits. Great. Thank you. Um, there were a few uh, responses that people provided um, for uh, the uh, some of the different um, questions that came out that um, one from uh, Pennsylvania, the Delaware and Lehigh Trail in our heritage areas is open as of now across 30 landowners. We coordinated with the landowners and created this sign a few days ago that we are helping install today across the region. So nice examples there and also from Montana. We're encouraging our small businesses, sole proprietors, et cetera, to utilize their local economic development organizations 
organizations to help them navigate available resources through the CARES Act. So um, some good uh, additional resources um, to share. Um, I wanted to open up um, one other uh, uh, question for the um, participants, um, and that was how to link those um, willing to donate with those most in need. There's, uh, this was um, a pre-Zoom uh, uh, call um, from, uh, that we got um, earlier on and asking what is the best way to get financial help to people who have never needed it before and may not qualify for safety net programs and therefore how to link those willing to donate with those most in need. So uh, who would like to respond to that? Maybe a couple of, of you might have a perspective. Alana, are you ready to, is that something sure. you can talk about, talk to? I mean, I, I think that um, it's important to find out where people are, right? We know that there are a lot of businesses that aren't going to apply for the EIDL or the PPP. In some states and some local jurisdictions, there are grant and loan programs that might work better for them. But I've heard from a lot of businesses, um, a lot of people who work with, with small businesses that um, businesses that are from our lower income population or businesses that um, uh, just come from different backgrounds may not have the paperwork in place to be able to quickly apply and, and they've never needed help before and they've always done it on their own before. So I do think that it's important um, as local community leaders to reach out to these businesses and really understand what their gap is. Um, is there a gap, uh, a funding gap? Um, how could it be filled? Um, I will tell you that some one jurisdiction that will remain unnamed at the moment, um, the local jurisdiction created an emergency grant program, but if you owe even $100 in fees to that jurisdiction, you can't qualify for that grant. And you know, somebody I was talking to said almost every small business owes something to that jurisdiction. So it precluded almost everybody that they felt like could apply to apply from that program. So I think it's really important to understand in detail what people are looking for. Um, in the big bill from, from the federal government last week, our small business development centers and our, our women business centers um, did receive additional funding so they can provide additional technical assistance to help businesses figure out. And I thought the, the suggestion of going through local economic development resources like that to figure out the right path is a great one. Um, uh, but we also know that communities, uh, a lot of communities are gonna be getting additional community development block grants and that's super flexible funding. Um, and so one of the things that I've been talking to folks about is how do you take a step and a pause figure, and actually talk to, and this is what we're starting to work with some communities on, um, how do you find those businesses that haven't come forward? How do you find the businesses that have never received uh, government uh, funding before? Find out what they need, what is that gap? And then actually create a strategy over the next six months um, to use CDBG or other funding sources to really be supporting them. But I do think it takes uh, really having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the business owners to understand what they're missing. Great, great, thank you. Um, any other comments on that? Okay, I'll go ahead and um, move along then. Um, we did also hear from the Georgia Trails Alliance uh, and they are using the system of tracking messaging um, on trail closures. So, and they provided a link uh, there as well. So again, we'll follow up with those um, following this uh, call. Uh, and a question, I'm not sure which state it was from, um, but I, a lodging business, uh, this uh, couple has a lodging business uh, and they were hit hard um, by the um, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, um, uh, but they own a bed and breakfast and wanted any suggestions on how to be enterprising during this time? Um, you know, is this the time to, to be um, reaching out? Or uh, it, Alana, I recall um, from one of the, the things that, one of the papers that you had shared is how important it is to provide a framework um, for moving forward. Um, so uh, perhaps you can talk to that or uh, uh, Kennedy or, or uh, Axie if they'd like. 
Um, I, I think there's a couple of pieces. One, uh, I know some lodging locations are offering up space for hospital workers. Um, I don't know if that works as well if you're a bed and breakfast, but um, uh, people who are working with uh, COVID patients uh, are trying to stay away from their homes and are, some of them have really long commutes. And so we're starting to see more partnerships between hospitals and hospitality um, to create space for that. Um, second is, um, I think that if you can um, show that there's a way to, to stay in business in any way and be providing folks a service, you can apply for this um, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, to be able to at least cover your costs. And it doesn't have to be um, payroll. I remind you because it, it does include sole proprietors. So you just have to show how much uh, revenue you earned last year, um, sort of comparison over time and, and be able to show that gap. So that might be a, a bit of a stop gap measure. Um, those are probably my two big ideas for you. I don't know if Kennedy and Axie have additions. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have much to add except that um, it is, it's a high contact business that um, means I think you don't want so many people going in and out right now. I think it probably is a good time to think through new product and service lines that could be offered in the future um, and, you know, take care of maintenance chores and things like that that you might not be able to do when you have people staying there all the time. So I think it's probably for some, for some kinds of businesses like that, maybe a downtime. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, both of you have, have uh, gotten some background on um, communities providing gift cards. Um, so adding on um, to that. Uh, so the gift cards, I guess they, they work like that um, you give somebody $25 in value and add another $10 or another um, uh, piece that uh, they can use either immediately or moving forward. Uh, could either of you speak to, to that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's precisely it, is you just, you put more value on the card than the person pays, uh, mm -hmm. pays, pays for. Um, and they can be used in the future, although there's a little bit of a bottleneck there because businesses will have lost income and, you know, when a restaurant reopens, the person who used to eat lunch there every day isn't suddenly going to eat 27 lunches, you know, so mm -hmm, there's, mm -hmm. but still it gives the business some cash flow. Um, now I've actually seen businesses raise money to capitalize new equipment by doing exactly this, you know, without there being a, 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 um, a pandemic on our hands. Uh, there was a coffee shop that I came across some years ago that needed a new espresso machine. It was about 10,000 bucks and they couldn't get conventional financing for it. And they were kind of a short, short timeline. So they sold, um, $50 gift cards for $25 uh, right before the, the, the winter holidays and encourage people to buy them as gifts. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. because their profit margin on coffee is so large, they were able to basically get all the cash they needed in within a week or two by the machine and um, make some new customers. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay, and we also heard from um, Bob Ratcliffe of National Park Service weighed in um, about the, the trails um, component and, and cited uh, National Recreation and Park Association and City Parks Alliance websites. Uh, he says, while most park and visitor facilities may be closed, much of the public parks and areas are open. About 75% of all local or regional parks departments are maintaining some level of access for local use. Obviously, we know there's some um, uh, pinpoints that are a little bit more difficult. But according to them, over 90% of local trails and open space networks are available for socially distanced activities for individuals and groups. So um, good to, to keep in mind. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, I wanted to share a, a question that we got um, also um, pre-call. Uh, and uh, this was um, from a small tourism office that relies heavily on funding from city and county governments. And they're concerned that if tourism activity doesn't rebound quickly, there could be the thought by elected officials that we don't need funding if there's not much to promote as before. So the question really is, what should we be doing to proactively prove our value in the short term and into the future? Anybody ready to think ahead? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that that's something our, our tourism department is thinking about now. You know, I, I think that 
we now have years and years of data showing how important this economy is to New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, again, obviously, I'm so hyper focused on New Mexico, but you know that's obviously where my head's at. And, and in New Mexico, our governor's priority is to diversify our economy, and COVID-19 isn't going to change that. If anything, I think it will accelerate it um, in large part because the other challenge for a lot of um, states is the, is the drop in oil and gas prices, which you know, New Mexico is heavily reliant on that sector too. So the whole push to diversify was to emphasize tourism, outdoor rec, that's really how my office got created. So we are likely going to be entering an emergency legislative session very soon. Um, we're going to be talking about recovery programs. And we're going to be talking about new budgets. And so I'd say any my guess is other states are going to be looking at something similar. So if you're a hotel in the local hospitality association, um, now I think is really the time to to unite and get some common messaging, whatever's right for your state. But that's what we're going to be helping facilitate. Again, through these surveys, we're really looking for feedback from local hotel owners, um, among many other uh, hospitality and service providers in the state to help us shape the programs that we know are coming Um, And at the same time, hopefully give them some relief in the interim. But I'd say like those voices are just going to be really critical in the next few months to make sure that we as a, I'll speak for the outdoor recreation industry, that we as an outdoor recreation industry are really united in this time ahead. Um, And I think the same goes for the broader hospitality association as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, There was also a a question about the status on quasi-government agencies, like some local tourism offices, regarding the CARES Act um, and other money resources. So this is um, a Kentucky question, um, but it should uh, be relevant to some other people. Um, So uh, they're asking for uh, any ideas on um, how the CARES Act or Um, if the CARES Act would apply to organizations um, that are not a nonprofit, they're not a small business, they're Um, quasi-governmental. So uh, let's see uh, if one of you are able to to share background on that at all. I can talk about it a little bit. Um, One of the things I shared in the chat is um, a a summary that I did of uh, the pieces of the CARES Act that um, are mostly about small business and unemployment, but also other pieces that have to do with community development um, and sort of surviving this from a community development perspective. It is not comprehensive in any way. It's really the bits that I found most relevant to the people I was talking to, Um, but it does have a lot of different kinds of funding in there. So just to give you a a little bit of, a little bite of it, under ag and rural development, there's nine and a half billion dollars to support ag producers. Um, There's 28 and a half million uh, for the rural business cooperative service. And there's 25 million for distance learning, telemedicine and broadband. Um, There's also 5 billion in community development block grants um, and a billion and a quarter on tenant-based rental assistance. It means that there's a lot of different, and then there's, billions and billions going to state and local governments. Um, And I spoke to one community in Pennsylvania that's a town of 14,000 people. um, And they just got, they were just told that they were getting a community development block grant uh, from their state that was almost as much as what they were gonna get for a whole year. Like, so um, there's a lot of money coming through state and local state governments that the states have to then decide to some degree how they're going to distribute it. Are they going to just do it based on population formula? There's a lot of flexibility at the state level. So I think it's important to go back um, to your state legislatures and, and to, to your elected officials and, and really advocate for the funding that's coming through the state level. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, there's also a, a significant um, thread uh, of Yelp and GoFundMe matching grant programs. Um, Some of those are are changing. Uh, There's also a GoFundMe for small business relief links. Um, So there's a a number of different um, components uh, there. Um, And uh, some 
more examples or resources um, for the CARES Act. Uh, Cheryl Hargrove talks about going using the U.S. Travel Association for updates on the CARES Act. Georgia's helping communities track lost income, especially from festivals and events, through our event impact calculator available from Tourism, Economics, and Destinations International. So some good resources there as, as well um, to take a look at. Um, and let's see. Um, there's also um, a question um, that we got ahead of time. Um, we asked um, them, how, how has your work changed? And um, just wanted to share this with you as uh, some consideration. Maybe some people have some, some ideas here. I've gone from promoting upcoming events, activities, to promoting local restaurants and businesses to local residents in an attempt to help make sure they are still around a few months from now. I'm spending all my social media budget to reach local residents with information about how they can still do business with our shops and res restaurants. I think we've talked a little bit about that, but um, if there's any more that, uh, that uh, could be added in here, um, providing some, some ideas. I think I, I think we've we've sort of covered it. You know, there's a lot yeah. to do there. I, I will say that there is there's a role for just everyday citizens too in um mm -hmm. in helping out here. And there are a number of organizations. The National Main Street Center has done this. The Institute for Local Self Reliance will be doing it early next week. Of 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 um, I'm putting up online free like flyers that you can post in a storefront um, or a door of a small business, saying here are things that you the public can do. And it's things like you know, leaving positive reviews for businesses, you know, not only to get them more visibility, but also just to show the business owner a little bit of love right now when it's kind of a tough time. Uh, buying gift cards, being flexible in how they shop, you know, continuing to shop, even though it's a little bit more awkward to do so now, and things like that. And I think it's, it's important to mention that too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and um, some follow-up, uh, Linda Devlin from Pennsylvania, uh, said, uh, said, as a 501c6, uh, we are not eligible for PPP, but IDLE is uh, eligible. These are low interest loans, not loan forgiveness, but the first 10,000 is a grant under emergency funding. These go through your local SBA, Small Business Administration. Um, and a question from Tracy Sanchez of, of Georgia, following up to AXIS. Uh, Kendra, one second. Um, yes. Everything I understand is that EIDL, you have to go through the federal SBA portal. It's not through your local lenders. The okay, one, not through EPP local. EPP is through your local SBA lenders. Um, and I, they could be changing things while we're on this phone and I could be wrong already. Sure. But from everything I knew as of 8 a.m. this morning, EIDL was still through the SBA, the federal SBA portal, and PPP is through your local SBA lenders. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, um, I wanted to mention something yep. else too, is that there are a lot of private sector um, funds that are coming together really quickly. It's hard to track them all, but Grant Watch is a good source to go to to see some of these coming out. But there are, you know, communities banding together, community foundations, corporations. Um, some of them are uh, focused on a specific need, like the needs of um, healthcare workers or the needs of restaurant workers, or some of them are have to do with just small businesses or minority-owned businesses. Um, micro businesses. So there are lots of them out there and it's worth just Googling around to see what you can find. And like I say, Grant Watch I found has been posting them pretty quickly the past few days. And there's a great Forbes article that's constantly being updated as well about all the state and local programs that are out there. Um, and I'll see if I can track down that link while we're on the phone and share that too. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and, uh, you know, I know this is uh, changing day by day and week by week. Alana and, and uh, Kennedy and I'm sure Axie as well have all been on um, other calls um, providing the, these updates. So um, we definitely want to um, track those and uh, continue to, to provide those. So more, more to come. <laughs> so and along those lines, Vince Palmier of uh, USDA Rural Development out of Ohio, he's um, asking, is anyone developing a list of best practices so we're ready, better prepared if by chance something similar happens again? Well, hopefully we're not going into round two of, of uh, 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 the COVID pandemic, but um, certainly 
uh, I think there's going to be all kinds of um, best practices and new ideas um, and new ways of, of operating um, businesses and um, just our way of life as we come, come out of this. Um, so uh, any comments um, towards that? Okay. Um, and uh, Tracy Sanchez of Georgia had uh, wanted to provide a follow-up to AXI um, and talking about how tourism uh, has demonstrated its value with the huge, uh, um, you know, opportunities. Um, but obviously there's economic losses um, that we noted uh, and just asked about um, states having ample data on the industry as to include tourism in their recovery plans going forward. Like what, um, what are you seeing in um, New Mexico um, in order to build that, that case? Yeah, I would say, I, I would A, agree 100%, like that the tourism has already demonstrated its value. I don't need the same thing about outdoor recreation. That's what we um, talk about basically constantly. So I think like, will it be part of the recovery plan? You know, 100%, but I think what that looks like is really up to some individual organizations and agencies throughout the state is to like think about that deeply. Um, in New Mexico, we really don't want to take it for granted that we're going to have the data that we need. Um, right now, we obviously the, the most the easiest data we have is unemployment data, which we obviously get once a week. Um, so that's a start. But we've already entered into talks with some of our universities to put together real social science surveys that will be promoted throughout the state, so we can really intentionally gather the data that we think we'll need with recovery going forward. So I think like that data gathering stage for us is probably gonna start really soon. The surveys that I brought up today are kind of just the first foray into that. We wanna work with some professionals in this space to be really intentional about the data we're collecting um, to, to measure in a very like intricate nuanced way, the economic impacts in New Mexico as a whole of COVID-19 and then specifically to the tourism sector and then specifically to the outdoor rec sector. Um, and I think we're really gonna need that going forward so we can be smart about what sorts of recovery proposals we put together. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, as we're getting close towards um, um, closing uh, the, the session down, I'm just gonna look if there's um, any other uh, components. Um, I, I did want a chance um, for uh, the three speakers um, to just um, provide any um, final uh, messages or, or words or, or um, opportunities. Uh, uh, certainly we will um, bring, bring the resources um, together, both the online um, resources uh, and anything that you share um, with us moving forward so we can really continue this um, discussion, these, these significant issues facing um, the world at, at this point. Um, before we do that, uh, and then I'll pass it over to, to Katie, but uh, I just wanted to ask you um, to, to share those ideas and resources um, for, for moving forward. We'd really like that. Um, so, uh, I, Kennedy, do you want to start just how can communities prepare for, for the future or your um, wrap up? Um, well, I think for, for everyone here, you know, many of whom are, are in positions of supporting small businesses, um, if not owning small businesses, um, I think there are really two things to do right now. One is to just stay on top of uh, new developments of new grant programs, of deadlines, of things like that that are coming out and making sure that you're feeding that information um, to the businesses in your community. And then the second, I think, is just being observant um, of the kinds of roadblocks and obstacles that businesses are, are running into now. Like one of the things that we didn't really talk about today, but I think it's going to be a huge issue, um, are supply chain problems mm -hmm. um, that uh, businesses are finding, uh, you know, I, I talked to an electrician uh, last week who was like, I could be doing a lot of work right now. It's not dangerous. I can be isolated by myself, but uh, some of the components I need come from China. And I can't get them. And so 
I think there'll be more attention to local and regional and national sourcing after this, but there could be many things like that. So I would say be aware of those things and um, you know, funnel them to the organizations that are sort of advocating for positive change coming out of this. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Axie, would you like to go? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I'll just talk about the outdoor rec side of things to, to wrap up. I think that the outdoors and outdoor recreation is gonna play a huge role in the recovery that we're facing, both from a economic side, but also from a health and wellness side. I think maybe some people commented on the huge benefits we get from being outside and the science that backs that up. And I, I know that there will come a time when we focus on that and we focus on accessibility, lowering barriers to the outdoors. That's what this office is all about. Um, it's just for us right now in New Mexico, now it's not that time. We're still gonna be focused on trying to reduce access um, and, and use in some of these places to keep our land managers safe, to keep our search and rescue team safe and to keep all of our New Mexican citizens safe. So really to end, it's to say as much as many of us love the outdoors, I think the best thing we can do right now is to stay home because going out can have all sorts of unintended consequences that I think New Mexico and some other states have seen. And really we have to focus as a state, altogether as a state on saving lives and the role of the outdoors will be even more crucial once we get a sense of the timeline of when things are gonna be open or when, if, when things are gonna open up and when we're allowed to actually get people outside again. Uh, and I do think it's gonna play a huge role in each of our individual recoveries and then the recovery of the, of the state and then the country as a whole. Great, thank you. And Alana. Well, it's been great to join everybody today. Um, I think um, the thing I would, I would say is I know everybody working at this uh, to support small businesses and, and working on, on community development through tourism, through outdoors, through whatever is going on in local communities, um, everybody's overwhelmed. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that. And um, I think it's important to figure out how to uh, be the conduit that Kennedy was talking about. And that's part of what I'm just trying to do in whatever I find. Um, but then also really find the people who aren't um, just popping up on the lists. Uh, I think we, we do have a responsibility to go out and find them um, and really understand their needs so that we don't end up uh, honestly with a country with greater income inequality and with more people and more places getting left behind. Uh, and, and I think it's time during this crisis to sit and think strategically and figure out how to find them and figure out the connectors we need to find them and make sure that we're providing that all everyone with the same amount of support um, su suited to their needs. Mm -hmm. So um, the federal programs are one piece of it. Um, state and local loan and grant programs will be one piece of it. The anchor institutions and private sector uh, programs that Kennedy talked about are popping up too and are great, um, but there's gonna be more need over the next six, 12 months. Um, and we need to understand what that is and, and how we strategically support that. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you to all three of the, the speakers. Some great perspectives here and, and this will um, continue. So um, check back to the, this website for the recording of the webinar, the resources collected today and updates going forward for sure. Um, and the presentation, the recording will be um, shared afterwards. So um, appreciate that. Uh, just to, as uh, we turn to the, the final component, um, I did want to uh, acknowledge in addition, Cynthia Sealhammer, um, town manager um, of Tucson, um, Arizona. She's the one who first reached out to us um, to propose this. So just want to acknowledge that she came on, uh, I think, mid-call. Um, and I found some piece in uh, some words from F um, uh, FDR. And he said, one thing is for sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we know how at the moment. So I hope we can hold that tight and um, keep on working together. Uh, and just, um, I think, Katie, are you still on? I don't see you. 
I got kicked off, but just in time to close this out, I guess. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all to jo for joining us this afternoon. Um, I think exactly as we talk through, um, there's more to come. So hopefully maybe there's something here where we can set up another check-in in six months and then a year and see where we are. I think. Oops, Katie, I think you froze again. <laughs> Well, on behalf of Katie, the Conservation Fund, and our amazing um, speakers, we really appreciate you working together on this. We know everybody's getting overwhelmed by these these uh, these calls, and it's uh, testing all of our uh, our uh, resources. But just want to say thank you to everyone, and look forward to hearing more um, back from all of you. Thanks. <laughs>